Good morning. Good morning. I'm Susan Peck. I'm here with Leon Burke, Jeffrey Stern, Evie Bromley, and Adam Peterson on piano to center our energies this morning in song. Our gathering music this morning is a beloved text by Rumi, set to music by Reverend Lynn Unger. This bass line was added in folk tradition at a Unitarian Universalist Minister's Conference several years ago, adding a crucial line from the original poem, as well as harmonic underpinning for the melody. Please rise in body, rise in spirit, and let us sing together. Oh, you've broken your vows ten thousand times, though you've broken your vows ten thousand times, though you've broken your vows ten Thank you, and good morning. I am the Reverend Mitra Jafarzada, and I am the settled minister with St. John's Unitarian Universalist Church in Cincinnati, Ohio. Yay! If you are wondering about my name, it is Iranian. My mother is from the Appalachian Mountains of Eastern Kentucky, and my father is from Iran. This makes me ethnically Persian-Latian and theologically Unitarian Universalist. <laughs> and I appreciate that we who have gathered have come representing UU congregations. Yes, we come as ourselves, but we come as ourselves in context. So let me tell you a little about the context that allows me to be here this morning. I am here this morning with St. John's pianist Adam Peterson and music director Dr. Jeffrey Stern. Together we serve a church that has been called in its 202 year history. The German Protestant and Reformed Church, the German Lutheran Church, the German St. John's Church, and finally in 1924, St. John's Unitarian Church. We added the Universalist later. If you noticed a theme in those early years is that we were most clearly German. You see, the church was founded by the Reverend Joseph Zaislin to serve an immigrant community. Early St. Johners were men and women coming to a bend in the Ohio River, hoping for enough good work to sustain themselves and their families in this, a new and foreign land. Zaislin created a place to gather in the wanderer and the worshiper, and the manner of your worship did not matter. You could be Lutheran or Evangelical or Calvinist or even Catholic. But what mattered was that you were a person in need of a spiritual home, in need of a people to call your own, in need of welcome and warm embrace. In those early years, the call was to come, come, whoever you were. Whether, whatever you believed, so long as you spoke German, you were welcome at St. John's. Now, I have an overly rosy idea of how those early days were. A diverse people bound by a nationality they had chosen to leave behind 
sharing the hardship of immigration, but ultimately noble in their pursuit of togetherness across whatever theologies might divide them. I imagined them a united and sturdy folk dedicated to seeking and serving the good wherever they found it. And they could do all of that because they all spoke German. To find a common language. How we do long to speak and be understood. How we long to listen and hear only the, the other only in their best voice to hear their best intentions, the purity and clarity of heart. If we could but find that center point, a clear path through the babble and all the confusion created by the blessed and beautiful variety of all our heritage of faith and ethnicity and theology, or lack thereof. But then again, Perhaps the magic of good church is not in what is spoken, but in how we speak to each other and how we choose to listen. And how we speak and how we listen has everything to do with our deepest theology. In 1869, Reverend August Kroll took a pair of scissors to St. John's hymnal. When he was done editing, he had a slimmer and more theologically appropriate book. In the preface, he wrote, in German, of course, one of the fundamental principles of this church is, God is your father, his nature and being is love, and you are his children. Therefore, your life ought to be one of love. To love God above all things and to love your neighbor as yourself, this is religion. This is eternal life. No hymn has been included which contradicts that spirit. Now, August Kroll was speaking my language. The language that holds us together from origin of Alexandria through Servetus and Parker and even Kroll is perhaps the same language that transcends ethnic origin or theological hair splitting or all human differences. The language that brings us and binds us belongs first to the soul that loves, the heart that seeks goodness, and the mind that assesses and adapts and adopts what we know to be holy. For the 200th anniversary of St. John's, we commissioned a new hymn from Jason Shelton and Kendall Gibbons. Jason was asked to write an anthem based on the structure of Luther's chorale, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, along with a harmony inspired by Johann Sebastian Bach. Our musicians will sing the hymn once through and invite you to rise in body or spirit and join in singing in this contemplative chorale all together. In glad thanksgiving, join the song, wherever you have come from, the hours of Please rise in body and in spirit and join us.
Thank you. Love in fuller freedom. It doesn't get better than that. Together with your congregation and mine, we have made a place where you can come if you are looking for a spiritual home or a people to call your own, or a welcome and warm embrace. In this Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations, you will find no common tongue, but the beauty of many languages spoken even as ears listen through the song for what we call religion. And what might that be? Well, what else can it be but the simple invitation to all who have known love to extend the same towards self and other? Throughout our assembly, may we seek to speak kindly, to listen gracefully, and to always keep our heart in a holy place. Please rise in body and spirit one more time to sing our closing song by Canadian Unitarian Universalist composer Joyce Poley. When our heart is in a holy place, when our heart is in a holy place, we are blessed with love and amazing grace. When our heart is in a holy place, when we trust the wisdom in each of us, every color. May love and kindness accompany us as we go through this work of our assembly and the joy of being together. So may it be.
Good morning. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, Columbus. I'm Jim Key, and I'm privileged to serve you as moderator and chief governance officer of our association. And it's in that role that I now call to order the 55th General Assembly of the Unitarian Universalist Association. Before we begin our work 
of our association together, I want to acknowledge that many of us are coming into this place with heavy hearts as a result of the mass shooting of our LBTQ and Latinx siblings in Orlando just 12 days ago. Last year, we were celebrating the Supreme Court decision that recognized marriage equality. We were joyous. Now we're grieving. But perhaps the most traumatized among us are our LGBTQ siblings. We know there may be triggering events this week that will require many of you to seek a quiet, safe, and sacred space. Such a sanctuary has been set aside in room C, 124 and 125, here in the Convention Center. All LGBTQ people are welcome in that sanctuary space throughout the duration of General Assembly. Allies may seek sanctuary in the meditation room, C115. The cruel and hateful speech that seems to be flooding news and social media these days is disturbing to all of us. Some public personalities are maligning people of color, people of faith, people who are refugees, people with different abilities, people with non-conforming gender expression, and even people who com express a compassionate view of the world. These evil expressions are the opposite of our belief in the inherent worth and dignity of all no exceptions. Moreover, too many black, young black men and women have been killed this year at the hands of police. This week, here in Columbus, yet another young black man was shot and killed by plainclothes police officers. His name was Henry Green. He joins Mike Brown, Sandra Bland, Ricky Aboard, Tamir Rice, and way too many others. How many of our black siblings will have to die this year? How many of our LGBTQ siblings? How many of our Latinx? How many of our children? It's easy to despair, and it's okay to withdraw from time to time as we reflect on answers. But this liberal and socially progressive faith calls us on. It is the work we are called to do, transform our world with more love, more justice, and more peace. Dr. King told us that darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So we are the love people, and we have a whole lot of loving to do this week. This week, we will deal with bylaw amendments, business resolutions, congregational study action issues, and actions of immediate witness that will ultimately lead to debate and a vote. These debates by passionate and committed UUs reveal our own humanity and sometimes lead to inflammatory language that does not represent our best selves. I want to expressly name these anxieties that we all bring into this space and ask that you participate faithfully and compassionately as we go about our business this week. Assume the best intentions of speakers and proponents and opponents of specific business items. Many of us will be challenged at our growing edges. Breathe. Breathe with me now. Try to move into your non-anxious presence that will serve us all well. We are in this together. I want to introduce our two seminary presidents. The Reverend Rosemary Bray McNatt is president of Star King School for the Ministry in Oakland, California, and the Reverend Lee Barker is president of Meadville Lumbar Theological School in Chicago. I've asked Rosemary, I've asked Rosemary and Lee to reflect on what it means to be in religious community during times of crisis and anxiety. Well, thank you, Mr. Moderator, Jim. Rosemary, he has really named it, has he not? He has indeed. Good morning. The hate speech, the palpable pain of the LGBTQ uh, community, the Muslim communities. 
You know, we've brought so much emotion into our assembly, but even before this recent spasm of pain and anger and frustration, there's been some real anxiety expressed about this GA and uh, about how these plenaries and about how we handle what are considered to be controversial issue, issues within our plenaries and our formal business sessions and our interactions with one another. You know, the, the world is on edge and the country is on edge and we're on edge and Unitarian Universalism is on edge and it's all yeah. right here, isn't yeah, it? It is, I've been feeling it too. There's, there's so much at stake for so many people in this country this year especially. And because our plenaries are usually this chance for us to discuss things that matter most to us. There's also this chance for us to behave in ways that leave people hurt and angry. Uh, we saw that last year in uh, the plenary, especially around the Black Lives Matter action of immediate witness. That was a hard conversation. And even last night at the beginning of our worship, um, we experienced some spasms of hurt and anger when our guest, um, Rabbi Jacobs, um, made an explicit uh, request of the assembly to vote against the resolution that's coming before this body later about um, the divestment issue as it relates to Israel. It's a conversation that has the same potential for hurt and misunderstanding. You know, I think as we go into these deliberations, it's uh, important to say that, that the most uh, privileged among us, uh, we especially have a need to acknowledge differences yeah. of power and identity and social location. And to be as conscious as we can be about how those differences in power and identity and social location can have a huge impact on how discussions get uh, played out and processed. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, I'm not much of a, a, a biblical literalist except for this particular phrase. <laughs> there's a time for speech and there's a time for silence. Mm -hmm. That is so true. Mm -hmm. And I know that I am uh, close to dangerous territory when I find myself starting to intellectualize the experience of other people. When I start to think, oh, you know, I get that, but he should be thinking, or they should be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, that means I'm right on the edge of saying something that could really hurt someone and dismiss their, pow their power, lack thereof, their social location and their identity. And their experience. Because so many times we do those, we have those conversations and what we really are doing is dismissing someone's real experience. So the challenge for us is not to extinguish our real feelings or not to be angry or to pretend that we're not hurt because all those feelings are real and they're true. The challenge is how we work through them mindfully and engage them in a way that honors people's experience, their creativity, their passion, and their real struggles um, that also honors the voice of the individual as well as the group. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates' book, mm -hmm. um, Between the World and Me. He writes to his son, um, about what it means to be a, a young African American growing up in, a, in an era when we have seen, you know, the murders of Freddie Gray and Mike Brown and and Laquan McDonald, you know, go on and on and on. And he he says to his son, "I did not want to raise you in fear or false memory. I did not want you to force. I did not want you forced to mask your joys." and bind your eyes. What I wanted for you was to grow into consciousness. Yeah, yeah, that's a real echo for me. I have sons and I'm from Chicago, so all those things really mean a lot to me. I think for us, it's important to remember and helpful for me to remember that as messy and as hurtful as some of these plenaries can be when we're talking about hard things, that 
in many ways, they're core to our spiritual practices as you use. And it's hard for people to think that, especially when there are people at the procedural mic and people running back and forth between the pro and the con mics. We're honoring the democratic process, which is one of our core principles. And we're honoring it at a time in our country especially when democracy itself feels imperiled. And so as we engage in these conversations, we could be reminded this is a spiritual practice for us. Very much so, and I think that there's a lesson in how we approach formation and ministerial formation in our, in our two seminaries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're charged with um, uh, helping ministers to be able to lead diverse people of diverse uh, beliefs and cultures. And in order to do that, new ministers have to be able to see and honor the common thread mm -hmm. that uh, links them to those they are leading. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, we have to help them discover their own spiritual anchors mm -hmm. and, and, and help them find their way that engages the whole heart and, and the mind and the spirit and the urge to serve at the same time. I think that's right. And I also think it's important for them to have that kind of grounding when they're going to be doing some profound uh, counter-oppressive work, which we're certainly training people, and I imagine that you are training people to do as well. They need tools, and they need a spiritual sustenance for themselves. I think that ritual is one of those things that's really helpful. Um, we use it a lot, and um, we want to encourage others to use it. So we're going to encourage you today um, by asking you to practice um, a ritual that I wish I could claim I created, um, but that Lee and I both were introduced to. Um, when we attended the uh, International Council of Unitarian and Universalists meeting, um, in preparation for their larger meeting in the Netherlands this summer. Um, we were taught this ritual, and it's a pretty um, simple one. Um, we want to encourage you to do it in groups of six or eight, however it falls out where you are. Um, and we could use Jim's help if he'd come over and join us while we get down. Oh, watch out, you're lost. And there goes my mic. You're going to have to trust us. I'm Rosemary's going to tell us what to do. Right. So it's really very simple. You turn to the person next to you and you say, I put my hand in yours so that we might do together what I cannot do alone. And then you turn. I put my hand in yours so that we can do together what I cannot do alone. And I put my hand in yours. Speak to each other. Why don't you ask them to stand? So just... would you stand as you're willing and able? Turn to people in groups and try that. I put my hand in yours so that we might do together what I cannot do alone. Yeah, 
Should we hold hands while we do this question? You want me to call him back, or do you want to? Let's gather back together if we can. Feel free to hold on another hand if you want to. Feel free to hold on if you want. But let's come back into a space of meditation and prayer. We offer this brief blessing to carry us forward through our week. May we see the messiness of our deliberations to be part and parcel of the spiritual journey. Knowing that we are ever growing into consciousness. And may we take for one another the certainty that we can do together what we cannot do alone. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen and amen. Thank you for that, Lee and Rosemary. Now we shift to business. Uh, and if uh, I'm a little distracting to you because of this, I was telling a couple of people that you should not look at your text messages on the opening day of general session before you shave. <laughs> you need to be in a non-anxious presence, as I've asked you to be, when you shave. So we begin our first general session with the review and adoption of the rules. This is what we usually do on Wednesday night, but uh, we thought that last night needed a different tone and setting. So I hope you've reviewed the agenda for the five general sessions over the next four days. They are in what we call the program book. You all possibly have one, right? You're going to need them over the next few days. The proposed rules of procedure can be found on pages 90 through 92. The rules will govern our consider, uh, consideration of and voting on the business items that will come before us during our general sessions. The rules are the same as in previous years with one change that I think you'll like. Note that Rule 6, Item D on page 90 of the program book indicates that time taken at the procedural mic for procedural questions will not count against debate time. I only ask that delegates are judicious with their procedures questions. There are a couple of rules that I want to focus on for you. Note that Rule 5 provides that no amendments to a business resolution, bylaw change, or rule change will be in order unless submitted for consideration at the mini-assembly for that item. Also, please note that Rule 2 provides that unless the association's bylaws require otherwise, Action on all matters will be decided by an uncounted show of voting cards or by an uncounted standing vote. A vote will be counted only in two instances. If there is doubt about the outcome of the vote, I will call for a count. A count will also be taken if so requested by a delegate and if 99 other delegates join the request. In either instance, the count will be made by the tellers who are present on the floor of the assembly. They're wearing those great vests. In addition, Rule 7 provides that separate microphones will be designated as pro and con for discussion of proposed bylaw amendments, rules, resolutions, or actions. The pro microphone is up front on your left, <laughs> and the uh, con microphone is on your right. There's also an amendment microphone over here close to the table, which has been placed at the front far right, and a procedural microphone, which has been placed immediately in front of me. Please note that points of personal privilege and points of information must be made from the procedural mic. Only delegates may speak from the microphones except by express permission of the moderator. That would be I. I strongly urge those of you who are attending General Assembly for the first time to read the rules of procedure, particularly look at Rule 6 on page 90 
of the rules so that you understand the time limits in effect. No person may speak on any motion for more than two minutes and only once. 30 minutes is the time allowed for discussion of any proposed bylaw amendment, rule change, resolution, or action. Are we good with the rules? Excellent. Will the vice moderator make the appropriate motion with respect to rules of procedure? Moved that the rules of procedure of this General Assembly as set forth in full on pages 90 through 92 of our program book be adopted by this Assembly. Is there a second? It has been moved and seconded to adopt the rules of procedure as set forth on pages 90 through 92 of the program book. Adopting the rules of procedure require two-thirds majority. Are you ready to vote? All right. There being no discussion of the rules of procedures, discussion is now closed and the vote is in order. All those in favor of adopting the rules of procedure, please do so by raising your voting card. Very good. Thank you. All those opposed? Let's wait for our off-site delegates to vote on these rules. And I don't have the, I'm pretty sure they're going to help pass it, though, since we already have two-thirds in the hall. So the rules of procedure set forth on pages 90 through 92 of the program book have been adopted. Do we know what pages we're on now? 90, 92. So uh, it was uh, four, 95 percent of the voters uh, offline voted in favor. Good for them. Now let me introduce the vice moderator of the UU Board of Trustees, Denise Rimes. Thanks so much and welcome to Columbus. As vice moderator of the board, one of the great joys that I have and a great joy of this association is welcoming and certifying new congregations. This year, it gives us great pleasure to present to you our Director of Congregational Life, Reverend Scott Taylor, and the Unitarian Universalist of Benton County, Arkansas. Established in 2009, UUBC is a vibrant spiritual community for Benton County, free of dogma and guided by love, reason, and conscience. They are a fellowship seeking knowledge, expressing love, providing service, and building community. Today we are very pleased to have two leaders from Bentonville with us today. Again, I am Reverend Scott Taylor, your Director of Congregational Life at our UUA. And today, we recognize, to both of you, we recognize not only that your congregation has official standing, but also that you are now surrounded by a wider, wider web of support, care, and mutual covenant. And so on behalf of our UUA staff and our wider association of congregations, I want to publicly pledge our support to you and honor your decision to be accountable to your fellow congregations. Now you are not alone. Now your journey is not your own. Now we are on a path together. And to honor this commitment of mutual support and obligation, I offer your congregation this chalice and this copy of the Cambridge Platform. May they serve. May they serve as a reminder that our hearts and fates are now intertwined. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome, friends, and best wishes for a long and rich history.
Thank you, Denise and Scott, and warm welcome to the UUs of Benton, Arkansas. Now welcome one of the co-chairs of your 2016 Wright Relationship Team, the Reverend Lisa Kemper. Uh, Lisa is the Associate Minister at the UU Congregation of Nashville, North Carolina. Lisa? Good morning. I am the Reverend Lisa Bovey Kemper, and this is my fearless co-chair, Stephen Ballesteros. We're happy to be here this morning. The Right Relationship Team exists for the five days of General Assembly to help us live into our covenant as Unitarian Universalists. We are here in our unmistakable orange. You'll see t-shirts or bandanas, pocket squares on some. We are here to walk with each of you as you navigate living in this diverse community. We are not your complaint department, nor are we a suggestion box. We are a team of people who will partner with you when you feel an ouch from another person, or if you realize you have caused an ouch and would like to make amends. We at this General Assembly are a people of many identities, people of color, immigrants, indigenous people, people of differing abilities, people of differing religious heritage, trans and gender non-conforming people, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and queer people. We are women, we are men, we are all genders. We are young, we are elders, we are boomers and millennials. Don't forget Generation X. We are a people of much privilege, and we are a people of some privilege, and we are a people of no privilege at all. As individuals and as a group, we are much, much more than could be described in these limited words. Each of us hold multiple identities, and each identity has different needs and wounds and blind spots. We hold many different ideas and opinions. And at each moment in time, on top of all that, on top of all that, we are a people living in the aftermath. We hold so many ongoing hurts, deaths and violations of brown bodies and queer bodies and female bodies. So many bodies hurt. Some of them our own, some of them our loved ones, and some of them faces we only met after their death. At the forefront this week are the mass shooting in Orlando and the sentencing in the Stanford rape case. Living in the aftermath of violence is challenging, friends. It is challenging. It is heartbreaking. It is traumatic. And so, in particular, this General Assembly, we are asking you for an extra dose of gentleness and compassion toward one another. This is not the first time that you've been asked this this morning, but I think we could do it as often as we want. Will you all take a deep breath with me? This week especially, remember to stay hydrated and rested. Know that our hearts are all a bit raw. And remember that your fellow attendees may be tender in ways that you cannot see. Breathe before you speak. Breathe before you respond. Love one another even if you do not know one another yet. And if you need help navigating a conflict, coming back to right relationship, we are here in our orange shirts and bandanas. There are two seats in the back uh, where you can find us, hopefully at all times, or you can call the number in your program book. We look forward to meeting you. Thank you. It is also important to our UU community here at General Assembly that we offer the presence and support 
of GA chaplains. It's a pleasure to introduce lead chaplain Reverend Jennifer Brooks. Reverend Brooks is the senior interim minister at First UU Church here in Columbus. Thank you, Jim. And greetings, Columbus General Assembly. Here at GA, we have many chaplains serving our various constituent groups. But here's what makes the GA chaplain team unique. All of our chaplains are Fellowship to UU ministers and were chosen by the GA planning committee to be available to everyone 24 hours a day. We're chosen and we hope that our diversity reflects the beauty of this gathering. Each day, the GA chaplains offer early morning spiritual practice in the meditation room. But even if you aren't an early riser, the meditation room is a great place to give yourself a break from the hectic activity of GA, a time for silence, meditation, or prayer during your GA activities. And please, make sure to pace yourselves. There's so much to do, so many old friends to see and so many new friends to meet. But please notice how you're feeling and if you need to, take a nap. <laughs> if you find yourself in need of pastoral care, come see us. We're here for you. Sometimes things at home catch up with you or events here trigger old pains. If that happens, every day we have drop-in hours at the chaplain office. And if you need a chaplain outside of office hours, or our office is just too far away, call the chaplain phone. It's monitored 24-7, so even if it rings over to voicemail, just leave a message and one of us will get back to you right away. And I mean right away. In other years, the GA chaplains have worked closely with the Right Relationships team, and that's true this year, too. In fact, our offices are almost next door. We know that oftentimes a breach of relationship needs both an institutional and a pastoral response. So we work with the Right Relations team to meet both needs. Now say hello to our 2016 GA chaplains, Reverend Jan Carlson Bull, Reverend Alex Holt, Reverend John Crestwell, Reverend Brian Mason, Reverend Teresa Soto, Reverend Karen Che. All during GA, you'll find us roaming throughout the convention center as well as in the chaplain office, and you'll know us by our hats. <laughs> Look for the bright gold logo. Even if you don't need to talk to us, feel free to drop by the chaplain office or pull us aside just to say hello. We're here to serve this gathering of beloved community. One last word. On Friday at about 12.30, there will be protesters outside the Convention Center. This is an opportunity to sing our heart song. With our, with our interfaith partners, we'll move through the world on wings and song, sharing our message of unity in diversity, sharing our message of love and welcome for all human beings. So to prepare today at 10 a.m., there is a peacekeeper training in room C113. Today, that's at 10 a.m., and today at 3 p.m., we'll be putting together angel wings that have been sent by UUs in Orlando, Florida.
Blessings on them and on all the people who work so hard to make that happen. Room C113 at 3 p.m. if you're good with mechanical things. And on Friday at noon, we will gather outside the chaplain's office with our interfaith partners to prepare to move outside on wings and song to share our message of love and welcome to all human beings. Though some may seek to divide and dehumanize, our heart song will confirm that we human beings are better together. Blessings on all of you. The chaplain corps is a very important part of any General Assembly, so we, we thank you for that, Jennifer. The GAPC is the committee of the association authorized by the bylaws, Article 5, General, Account General Assembly Planning Committee. It is a committee accountable to the delegates rather than to the governance structure of the association, the Board of Trustees. The chair of the General Assembly Planning Committee is the Reverend Chip Roush, and he is the minister of First Unitarian Church of South Bend, Indiana. Welcome, Reverend Roush. Thank you, Moderator Key. Good morning. I am honored to work with a very talented, very dedicated group of people on the General Assembly Planning Committee, and it should be obvious that as remarkable as they all are, the committee does not actually create our General Assembly, nor do we create all of the programs and meetings held in connection therewith during the days before and after General Assembly. Rather, our committee creates the structure within which the speakers, musicians, officers, ushers, vendors, staff personnel, dancers, aerialists, delegates, and thousands of other Unitarian Universalists go about creating transformational experiences for each other. This week we have gathered to do the business of our association. We will also mourn and celebrate. We will witness for justice, and we will share an uncountable number of ideas and best practices. Many of us will leave GA feeling that our lives have been changed in profound ways. Helping to create the space for all that to happen is one of my favorite things. The work of the planning committee can be difficult, challenging, exhausting, and immensely rewarding. We and the rest of our Unitarian Universalist Association are always looking for new members, new leaders, talented leaders who help us to more closely resemble the society in which we live. If you think you would like to serve on the planning committee, please do look up the nominating committee process online by the August deadline. Finally, allow me to introduce this year's General Assembly Planning Committee. It is truly my pleasure to serve with these good people. Catherine Allen, Mary Alm, Deborah Gray Boyd, Jennifer Gray, Isla Cleon, Tuli Patel, Samuel Prince, and the Director of General Assembly and Conference Services for our UUA, Jan Snegus. Thank you. I've been amazed for these past three years of the magic. Uh, they all pull together behind the scenes every year, year after year. Now I want you to meet the co-deans of the Youth Caucus for this General Assembly. So welcome, Andrea and uh, Eric. Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Broner, and I'm from the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Atlanta in Atlanta, Georgia. And my name is Andrea Briscoe, and I'm from Mainline Unitarian Church in Devon, Pennsylvania. 
We are the co-deans of the Youth Caucus here at General Assembly 2016. There are over 190 high school aged youth at General Assembly this year. And we could not be happier sharing our faith with y'all. <laughs> Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> we would like to formally invite everyone of all ages to share our space in room C213 and 214 of the Convention Center. We'll be hosting workshops and worships all week that you can find in your program book. And we would like all ages to be there. We would love to see every one of you share our space throughout GA, working with us to create intergenerational con connections. Youth Caucus staff will be wearing pink bandanas throughout the week. Please come up and talk to us if you have any questions, or even if you just want to talk. We love doing that too. This year, we have programs about anti-racism, anti-oppression, multiculturalism, intersectionality, and social justice, as well as some great worships and many community building opportunities. We hope our programs help you reconnect to our Unitarian Universalist values, reach out across generations, and try something new. We are so excited to be in this community, and we hope you join in us with celebrating our faith. Thank you. Thank you both. Now let's meet the co-facilitators of Young Adults at GA, otherwise known at YA at GA. Hello, everyone. My name is Isla Halberstadt, and I am from the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Central Oregon. And I'm Cameron Young from Westside UU Church in Fort Worth, Texas. We are the co-facilitators of Young Adults at General Assembly. We couldn't be more excited to be this year's co-facilitators. You can identify us and other YAGA staff throughout the week by the blue bandanas we will be wearing. We invite all ages to come spend time with YA at GA in rooms C210 to 211 in the Convention Center all week where we are worshiping together, building community, and hosting workshops like multi-generational discussions to TED-style talks all week. We look forward to being in Columbus with you all and look forward to connecting within and beyond our faith this week. Have a wonderful GA. Thank you, Isla, Cameron. Now please welcome Patty Cameron, who is here to tell us about accessibility services at this General Assembly. The GA Planning Committee and Patty have done a great job over the years at making GA a little more accessible to more and more people each year. So let's hear what Patty has to tell us. I want to extend my warm welcome to General Assembly 2016. My name is Patty Cameron, and it's my pleasure to coordinate accessibility services at General Assembly. Our services are available to anyone registered here at General Assembly and our goal is to provide assistance that allows everyone to participate fully in GA. It is our collective role to practice radical hospitality in order to build a beloved community, a community that includes everyone. Those who use mobility equipment, listening devices, interpreters, have chemical sensitivities, assist dogs, or need special seating to accommodate for vision or hearing. It's our collective role to welcome all. While you're here at GA, please pay particular attention as we pass along the halls, navigate the public witness event, 
and attend workshops together. Move along in the hallways, remembering scooters have no brakes. Please don't stop suddenly to chat because the person behind you using a scooter can't stop suddenly. As convention centers go, Columbus offers very few elevators that can be, that, and they, that can't begin to accommodate all who need one. Please reserve the elevators for people with mobility and health needs. I invite you to be with one another this week in ways that allow you to practice radical hospitality, that stretch your comfort zone, enrich your spirit, open your heart a little or a lot, and widen your field as you take in all those around you, whether they walk or ride. We are all part of this General Assembly, one beloved community, a bright, wonderful community of people of all abilities. Be with each other in love. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. She uh, really organizes a great ministry on accessibility. Thanks very much. The Commission on Social Witness is another important committee articulated in our bylaws in Article 5, and like the GAPC, is accountable to the delegates and outside our association's governance structure. So give it up for the chair of your Commission on Social Witness, Dr. Susan Geckler. Thank you. As elected and appointed commissioners, we serve you all year long. Some of the things that we have done since the last General Assembly are soliciting and reviewing proposals for congregational study action issues. There were six that were submitted. After reviewing them, we found four eligible for consideration. They were then sent as part of the congregational poll. They were required to have at least 25 congregate, 25 percent of congregations uh, vote to approve adding them to the agenda, and that is what you find in your program book now on pages 93 to 96. We also reviewed sermons. There's a sermon contest for social witness, and we looked at the various processes that are involved in doing social witness work. I would like to thank the other members of the commission, the Reverend Christina Solari, the Reverend Caitlin Cotter, Richard Bach, and Jafia Christos Rogers. You can also find us when we're on duty wearing our hats that say CSW, so look for the hats. There are some business items that you will be having to do um, if you are a delegate at this General Assembly. We do not believe in divine inspiration or papal infallibility or anything like that as a way to decide and discern how we should be in the world and how we should be responding to things going on in the world. It is through the democratic process that we make those decisions, and so it is up to you who are delegates to help us discern and determine what our positions will be on various issues that are facing us as part of a larger public. Each day, you, those of you who are delegates, I encourage you to pick up when you come into the general session hall the CSW alert. It will be different each day. It's also available on the GA app, so those of you interested in sustainability, you can find it there and you don't have to take a copy of it. So that gives you information for each day, and I ask you to look at that. Some of the things that you want to do as a delegate um, would, would uh, um, go back, please, to the previous slide. Um, there will be many assemblies, as was mentioned when we talked with about the rules of procedure. Um, there is one today to look at the four proposed Congregational Study Action issues. These are issues 
that are selected every two years. We only select one at a, every two years for four years of study and action. They're not just to sit around and talk about for four years. Whatever is selected, you, you staff will then prepare uh, guidance documents for congregations to use, and that will be available by November the 15th. We encourage you who are delegates here and participants here that whatever issue is selected, that you go back to your congregations and engage your congregation in conversations around these issues. All of the issues that are proposed are important issues. It's not that we should only do one. This is the one that we will be doing collectively throughout congregations all over the world. But the others are certainly ones that you or your congregations, we hope, will also engage in as you are so moved and as it makes it as appropriate for you and for the work that you are engaged in. On Friday at the general session, there will be uh, information provided by proposers and advocates for each of those issues. So I encourage you to listen to what they have to say, read the proposals, make your decision, and think about what it is that you think would engage your congregation um, that, you would like, that they would like to participate in. Be informed voters. There, another thing that we do manage is the action, actions of immediate witness. There are two different types of statements. The statements of conscience, which are the result of the four years of study and action, actually carry the full weight of the association and allow several opportunities for congregational input through those four years. An action of immediate witness expresses the intent of you, the delegates, at this particular General Assembly, but because there is no opportunity really for congregational input and things are done very quickly, they're not, they don't carry the same weight in terms of official policy of the association. You will see people who are putting forth actions of immediate witness, something that they think is so important that it can't wait for four years of study and action, or that uh, is very narrow and doesn't need that. Some have already been proposed, and if you want to see what they are, you can come to the CSW booth, room three, number 314 in the exhibit hall. Um, there will be a vote Saturday morning to select up to three to place on the final agenda for consideration for approval. That vote will take place on Sunday afternoon. You will have information in the CSW alerts on Saturday and Sunday about the issues that are proposed. If you have any questions about what we do or the process of offering social witness, we encourage you to come to the booth. You can also come to a listening session that's going to be held Saturday late afternoon to think about the processes and whether there are better ways to do the work that we're doing together in community. And also, for those who are off-site, you can go to Social Witness uh, website and go to the uh, email there, socialwitness at uua.org. Thank you. Thank you for that, Susan. And uh, for those of you that are interested in how we do social justice, uh, you should uh, avail yourself of uh, a workshop uh, tomorrow at 445, a vision for social justice witness. Talk about how we might do this going forward. The Commission on Appraisal is the third organization to report this morning that is accountable to our delegates under our bylaws and not to the governance structure. So I'm pleased to introduce to you the chair of the Commission on Appraisal, the Reverend Nato Hollister, entrepreneurial minister of the Sacred Fire Missional Community in Scarborough, North Carolina, with sites in Brooklyn and Seattle, and probably coming to a community near you. Good morning. I can take this opportunity to joyously announce that we have just planted our fifth covenanted community, and I'll uh, welcome conversation about more in the future. The Commission on Appraisal hopes to complete our study of class and classism 
in time for GA 2017. There were many challenges in reconstituting ourselves as a working group following the developments in 2015, when proposed changes to the composition and the very existence of the commission meant some understandable turmoil and flux. The commission, which was reaffirmed at GA 2015, experienced significant transitional issues which we believe have served the current commissions, commissioners as strengtheners, enabling us to come together as a viable team. We stand on the shoulders of all of the commissioners who have come before us, but in particular, we see our work on class and classism as a natural outgrowth of the valuable study of recent commissions on appraisal that studied membership, governance, and polity, and theological diversity. The transitions over the last year and a half included the resignations of some commissioners and the ends of terms of others. Since GA 2015, we've brought our numbers up from two to the current six. And we can report that this size seems both efficient for the work and a good use of our UUA resources. At this time, we are, we are therefore recommending that no new commissioners be, re be nominated and that the issue on the number of commissioners be put before the General Assembly in 2017. During our two face-to-face -face meetings since last year's GA and our monthly conference calls, the Commission has structured the completion of our project on class and classism and has begun a significant uh, rewrite and supplementation to the preliminary report that we presented last year. At our face-to-face -face meeting in Philadelphia in March, we had the opportunity to meet with Finding Our Way Home, uh, the group of Unitarian Universalist professionals and seminarians uh, who are people of color. We received valuable feedback from the members of the F. OWH, who were generous with their time and their insights. Their assistance will prove to have an invaluable in, uh, influence on the Commission's study of class and classism. We are pursuing and we are engaged in dialogue with voices from all classes to aid us in this work. We're focusing on how class and classism affects all of us differently, especially in the light of intersecting oppressions of race, gender, sexuality, ability, age, and others. We are collecting your stories. You can find on the UUA website a link to a, uh, a place where we can give you the opportunity to share your story with us. Please do so. We look forward to GA 2017 when the report on class in the UUA will be presented to this assembly. It's our fervent hope that this study will help bring our UUA to bo closer to the beloved community to which we aspire. Thank you very much. Thanks for that report, NATO. And so you see, there, there will be one coming to a community close to you soon. See, no, don't. The Presidential Search Committee, yet another of the structures established by the delegates and outside of our governance structure, that's them on the screen there, was pleased to present their nominee for the Office of President of the Unitarian Universalist Association. The committee spent several years listening to you, creating a job description, soliciting names, reviewing applications, interviewing applicants, and vetting the possibilities. After naming two candidates, one withdrew several weeks after announcement. The bylaws for this new procedure precluded any process other than to encourage candidates to run by petition. Two answered the call. As most of you know, these are, candidates, these are the candidates for president of our UUA. The Reverend Allison Miller, selected by the committee, and the Reverends Susan Frederick Gray and Jean Pupke, who entered by a petition. I encourage you to attend the Presidential Candidate Forum, which takes place in this hall on Saturday at 1.15. After the election, next year in New Orleans, the Search Committee will present to the Board of Trustees and the delegates a report on what they learned with this new process. Until then, they encourage each of us to get to know these candidates, engage the conversation, and enjoy our beautiful and wild and sometimes messy democratic process. Oh, boy. Now I'm pleased to introduce the Reverend Eric Cherry, director of our international office, who will introduce our guests from around the world. Always interesting.
Good morning. It is such a blessing for all of us to be joined by many Unitarian, Universalist, and interfaith colleagues from around the world again at our General Assembly this year. As you know, the sixth principle of the Unitarian Universalist Association reminds us that we covenant to affirm and promote the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. May the time that all of us share together at General Assembly this year contribute to the journey toward achieving that vision in the days to come. We are so glad to welcome the following international guests this year. First, to reintroduce you to our friends from Risho Kosekai, our Buddhist colleagues in Japan. We are honored to welcome Executive Specialist for Interreligious Cooperation, Reverend Masahiro Nimota. And from RKK's External Relations Group, Ms. Ekuyo Kase and Ms. Kyoko Hirota. And from Tsubaki Grand Shrine, one of Japan's most ancient Shinto shrines, it is a great pleasure to welcome our dear partner, Chief Priest Guji Yamamoto and Priest Reverend Ochiai. From the Religious Society of Czech Unitarians, we are honored to welcome President Tina Lederarova. and the Minister of the Prague Unitarian Church, Reverend Peter Samoyski. From Ahmedabad, India, where he has long been a courageous social justice activist and partner with the UU Holding India program, and where he now serves as a Unitarian minister, we are deeply honored to welcome Reverend Mahesh Upadhyaya. From our dear colleagues at the Hungarian Unitarian Church, it is a great honor to welcome a number of guests this year. Reverend David Jeru, the Deputy Bishop and also the President of the International Council of Unitarians and Universalists is with us. Also from Transylvania, Reverend Laszlo Mayor is the minister of the Unitarian Church in Dach and the current Bullish scholar at Star King School for the Ministry and the minister of the Unitarian Church in Bologna, Transylvania, Reverend Albert Kozma. Welcome. From the European Unitarian Universalists, representing UU fellowships and individuals in France, Germany, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Belgium, and beyond, we welcome President Matt Gilsenin and seminarian Lara Fuchs. From the Unitarian Union of Northeast India, we are so honored to welcome the Chairwoman of the Orphanage Management Committee, Bari Mukim. Welcome, Bari. And we welcome Armin Pedro, a lay leader and seminarian from the Unitarian Universalist Church of the Philippines. And arriving just late last night, what a great honor it is to welcome Blaise Takarutimana, a lay leader from the Unitarian Church in Bujumbura, Burundi. (laughs) 
Blaze is in the United States seeking um, refugee status here, and it is so wonderful to have you with us and to share a message from our colleagues and friends in uh, war-torn Burundi. Thank you for being with us, Blaze. I'd also mention that uh, from the International Association for Religious Freedoms Human Rights Resource Center in Talampadu, India, but not arriving until tomorrow, we will welcome Brother Albert Xavier. So thank you again to all of our guests from around the world who have joined us this year for General Assembly. To everyone, please take a moment to greet our friends and neighbors from around the world while you're here, and consider joining us at some of the workshops that are listed on the screen, which many of our international guests will be participating in at this General Assembly, including on Friday evening when Reverend Fuljans Jagijamana, the minister of the Unitarian Church in Bujumbura, Burundi, will be uh, talking with us about the current situation there. Thank you again, one and all. Wasn't he terrific with all those pronunciations? <laughs> I tried that my first year. Notice I don't do that anymore. You've been introduced to a lot of folks this morning, so let's change things up and sing a bit. I have a few friends with me this morning. Susan Pick, Peck, our gifted GA music co coordinator, will give us a lyrical lift and lead us in some singing. You like the alliteration? Susan is the new director of music in Albuquerque, New, New Mexico. Joining her is Hal Walker, um, music director of the UU Church of Kent, whom I had the great privilege of hearing recently at a district assembly. So welcome, Susan. Good morning. How are you all feeling? Are you ready to sing? As your GA music coordinator, it is my great honor to introduce Hal Walker, one of the most talented musicians I know. Joining Hal are Andy France and Kathy Key, and the three of them make up the trio You, You, and Me. They'll be giving a concert tonight at 9.30 after the service of Living Tradition, so you can hear more of their music this evening. Hal's gonna teach you a little part that you're gonna sing, and then they're gonna sing, and he'll bring you back in. All right. You know, there, uh, at the end, there, there are some hand motions and body motions that go with this song. <laughs> uh, give it a try. <laughs> So if you would uh, sing after me, it goes like this. Comes a dawn with every day. Comes a dawn with every day. Make a smile and share it and give it away. Make a smile and share it and give it away. Shine a light. Brighten up a cloudy day. Brighten up a cloudy day. Shine a light and share it. Bring on the day. Shine a light and share it. Bring on the day. Beautiful. Let's try that one more time. I go, then you go. Add the hand motions if you're inspired. It goes like this. Comes a dawn with every day. Comes a dawn with every day. That's good. Make a smile and share it and give it away. Make a smile and share it and give it away. Brighten up a cloudy day. Brighten up a cloudy day. Shine a light and share it and bring on the day. Shine a light and share it and bring on the day. Beautiful, beautiful. Let's try the whole chorus together. Here we go, everybody. Comes a dawn with every day. Make a smile and share it and give it away. Bright enough a cloud. Shine a light and share it and bring on the day. Bring on the day. Here's the 
Here's the song. It sounds like this. A new light is holding. Our hearts are unfolding. Beauty is breaking right through the dawn. All loving, all knowing, all giving and growing. This life ever changing within the song. Oh, Father, oh, Mother, oh, Friend, and oh, Lover, life wonderful. Release us, protect us, challenge us, guide us through all in all. And love grows when the light moves between you and me. We gotta shine that light and make ourselves free. The morning is coming. There's a warm breeze a blowing, and the birds sing a tune with a melody. All hearts are ascending, all brokenness mending. Strangers and friends are as family. Oh, father, oh, mother, oh, friend, and oh, lover, life wonderful. Release us, protect us. Challenge us, guide us through all in all. And love grows when the light moves between you and me. We gotta shine that light and make ourselves free. Here's the part where we all sing, come to dawn. Here we go. Come to dawn with every Smile and share it, give it away, brighten up the cloudy day. Shine light and share it, bring on the day, comes the dawn with every day. Make a smile and share it, give it away, brighten up the cloudy day. Shine light and share it. everybody. See you tonight. Nice break, yes? You get an opportunity to hear more of Hal's musicianship tonight with a concert following the service of the living tradition in Union Station Ballroom A. Friends of the UUA allows the Unitarian Universalist Association to respond to the needs of all of our congregations and strengthens our voice for justice and equality in the world. It supports all of the work of the association. I hope that you'll be a friend here at GA, and I have an incentive for you to be one this week. I invite you to enter the Be a Friend drawing for a chance to win a trip to GA 2017 including registration for two adults, New Orleans hotel accommodations for four nights, and a fabulous New Orleans gift basket in your hotel room. Maybe there will be a few beignets in that basket. <laughs> Probably not, though. You need to go to the Café du Le Monde uh, after midnight and eat them while they're hot. I'll see you there. But I digress. Please consider making a suggested donation of $20 or more along with your entry. We are grateful to the four donor families who have pledged $20,000 in matching gifts to help inspire your generosity. So give it up. <laughs> to enter, visit the Stewardship and Development booth outside the exhibit hall or go to uua.org slash be a friend. Thank you. Now please welcome Leslie McFadden and Lena Gardner of the Black Lives of UU Organizing Collective.
They and their team have been very, very, very busy since the Black Lives Matter action of immediate witness was overwhelmingly supported last year in Portland. Leslie? Good morning, General Assembly 2016. My name is Leslie Mack. I founded the Ferguson Response Network, and I'm a black UU from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Last July, with support from the UUA Office of Multicultural Growth and Witness, a group of black UUs attended the Movement for Black Lives Convening in Cleveland at Cleveland State University, not too far from here. I personally served that weekend as a convening co-coordinator, while another Black Lives of UU organizer, Alandria Williams, led the on-site safety team. Over several meals that weekend, black UUs engaged in a series of conversations which planted the seeds that would ultimately become Black Lives of UU. Our work over the last 10 months as a collective has led us here to our participation at General Assembly, where we hope to engage with many of you directly. Our four session program track is designed to be both informational and transformational. We begin with two sessions, one later today, the Black Lives Convening and Explicitly Black Spaces and Black Lives in Unitarian Universalist History. Black UUs who attended the m for bl convening will talk about their experience in the first, and our own Kenny Wiley focuses on the long history of black UUs making change for our faith and in the world in the second. Our final two sessions are workshops that include affinity spaces for black folks, non-black people of color, and our white allies. An introduction to anti-blackness will delve into the ingrained ways that black people and blackness are made to seem less than. And in our final session, a double session in fact, our ongoing work, which begins in affinity spaces and transitions into a combined space, geared to enable attendees to leave this General Assembly with concrete ways to move forward. We invite everyone to join together for these sessions, as well as for our Black Lives Centered closing worship Sunday afternoon. Together, we know that we can transform our faith. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lena Catherine Gardner, and I work at the Church of the Larger Fellowship, and I'm part of the, yes, CLF, woo! <laughs> I'm part of the Black Lives of UU Organizing Collective, also one of the early organizers of the Black Lives Matter Minneapolis chapter. Thank you. <laughs> Last time there was a black revolutionary mo movement, thousands of black UUs were so hurt by the actions of some, they permanently left our faith. I want us to learn from our past. Those events, the injustice of black slavery, indigenous genocide, and land theft can move us into despair. It can move us into hopelessness. We can let guilt and shame paralyze us, or we can do something different. For every one of us, investing in Black-led organizations and leadership is one of the most powerful things we can do to resist white supremacy. We must be willing to support groups in innovative ways, ways that may be uncomfortable, ways that are different. We must be willing to help people grow in areas they don't have a lot of experience in and trust them to do the work in a new way. Giving money and supporting black leadership cannot bring back lost lives. It cannot mitigate the continued injustices that we sustain, but it can be part of our ongoing journey towards justice as you use. It can be part of changing. I believe we can embrace our history and forge a new path toward liberation. When we don't turn away or diminish our, our history, we can learn from it. 
When we listen to the new leaders and make space for new ways of doing things, we can build a new way. Let us journey together into discomfort. Let us have courage to take new risks together. Let us give as we have never given before of our money, our time, and our talents. The Black Lives of UU Organizing Collective is deeply rooted in Unitarian Universalism. We are here doing this work because we insist on working toward making the first principle of this faith a reality. To say we affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person is a nice start, but we, each and every one of us in this faith, have to do work to make sure that's true. Many of you, through hanging church banners and going through to protests and so much more, have deepened your commitment to the Black Lives Matter movement. It's going to take all of us. If you are white, we need you to take risk. Risk disrupting unjust systems, risk pointing and pushing your congregation to do more, to risk pointing out white supremacy when you see it, and to risk trusting people and voices that our society tells us have less value. For people of color, our challenge is to lead with care, with courage, and in solidarity with each other. The less society says we should trust someone's voice or experience, the more we need to listen to them. Black Lives of you, you is here to move from the margins toward the center and bring our face great promise, the idea that we are all connected and that each of us has inherent worth to fruition. On Saturday morning, right here in this hall, the assembly will take a special collection on behalf of Black Lives of you, you. By itself, as Lena said, money won't end white supremacy, but it can buy us tools to put some real dents in it. We need one another. May we be the Unitarian Universalists who give fiercely, who love deeply, and who, through not just our words and our banners, but also through our deeds and actions, proclaim that black lives matter here. Thank you. Lena and Leslie, yeah, uh, thanks so much for your work this year. You, you, you just have no idea how busy they've been and how effective they've been. I can attest to their hard work, and I remind you of the collection that will be taken on Saturday to benefit Blue. Beacon Press has been publishing since 1854 and in an integral part of our association. As Chief Governance Officer, I'm keenly aware of the Board of Trustees' responsibility for fiduciary oversight of our association, and that includes our very own Beacon Press. I've been impressed with their financial success over the past years with, when other imprints are struggling. It seems to imply there's a market for books from a progressive publisher such as our own Beacon Press. Helen Atwan is appointed director of Beacon Press by the Board of Trustees in October of 1995. Please join me in welcoming Helen. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Um, I'm so happy to be here reporting on your press in my 21st year as the director of Beacon. It's been a wonderful ride. I'd like to think that Beacon is a place where faiths connect. Certainly, we've been publishing books by faith leaders for over 160 years. And of course, we are so proud of publishing this vital, essential blueprint for, the inter for interfaith work by Reverend William Barber, one of our new century's most prominent and powerful religious leaders. I feel not only very proud, but also 
very grateful to be speaking before him because I have had the joy of hearing Reverend Barker speak, and believe me, nobody wants to follow him. <laughs> but don't worry, I only have five minutes. Before coming out to GA, each of you was invited to explore some resources offered by the UUA and Beacon. Of one, of course, was the third Reconstruction, Reverend Barber's book. Another resource was a section from Ibu Patel's forthcoming book, Interfaith Leadership, a Primer, which Beacon has made available in advance of publication specifically so we could share it here with you all at General Assembly. You were invited to follow Ibu Patel's lead and find your own interfaith story and share it with family, friends, and congregation. Those of you who haven't yet found Ibu's work, there are three wonderful books awaiting you. And where does interfaith connection begin? With our children, of course. We need to teach children about the rich diversity of beliefs and traditions that surround them, not only in our congregations, but in our schools. Faith Ed demonstrates that there is a place and a pressing need for teaching about religion in our public schools. Beacon author Deborah Zhang Li began her own initiative, One Book, One Church, a national inner church book club that will read Rescuing Jesus with an eye towards developing concrete strategies for practicing radical inclusion and pursuing authentic social justice. Over the course of the summer of 2016, communities across the nation will read Rescuing Jesus together, discuss the material online, and participate in online events featuring conversations with the author and leading progressive evangelical thinkers and activists. Urban Village Church, a Methodist church in Chicago, began this with Deborah, and there are currently about 700 people signed up. Now, doesn't that sound like something you and your peers want to join? It's one book, one church. Deborah Jangley. Do it online. We publish, as you can see, many books about faith and faith leaders. We also publish many books about the issues that are of deep concern to people of all faiths. Lifting up the voices of activists and thought leaders is what we strive to do year after year. And this year, I'm humbled to be speaking, even briefly, before the prophetic and inspiring Reverend William Barber. Thank you. And thanks for your eternal support. Thanks, Helen. I can report that I've read the third reconstruction, and it is worth your attention. And uh, maybe I can get my copy signed uh, by Reverend Barber later today. The Reverend Dr. William Barber II is the architect of the historic Marl Mundy movement in North Carolina. He's also author of the new Beacon book you've heard us reference. Let me give you the full title. The Third Reconstruction, Marl Mundy's Fusion Politics and the Rise of a New Justice Movement. As you know, North Carolina has been ground zero for voter suppression and more recently in the fight for transgender equality. Actions of legislators in North Carolina have made my state of residence, South Carolina, appear progressive. <laughs> Reverend Barber is leading the fight to defend voting rights and helping build a broad movement to stop hate. He has emerged as a prophetic national justice leader for these times. In April, Reverend Barber, along with Reverend Dr. James Forbes, launched a national moral revival tour, Time for a Moral Revolution of Values. This tour will redefine morality in American politics and challenge leaders of faith and moral courage to be more vocally opposed to harmful policies that disproportionately impact the poor 
people who are ill, children, immigrants, communities of color, religious minorities, and the trans community. You can find out about the tour and when it will be coming to your area at ourfuture.org. I first met Reverend Barber in Selma as we commemorated the 50th anniversary of the march from Selma to Montgomery. I was privileged to share the platform with him and many other elders of the Civil Rights Movement at a mass meeting at the First Baptist Church of Selma. I marched with him and President Morales and hundreds of UUs last summer in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and thousands of others to defend voting rights. And I plan on joining him when the Morrill Revival Tour comes to Charleston, South Carolina on August the 8th. I invite all of you who may be in the area and want to experience the low country of South Carolina in August <laughs> to come and join us. It is my very great honor and privilege to welcome the Reverend Barber to speak to our General Assembly. Hold up. Thank you for what you are doing in your work for justice. Be assured that Unitarian Universalists stand in solidarity with you. Please welcome. Great love. Great love to all my UU friends. Spirit of God, fall on us fresh this morning. Amen. Amen. To Jim, to Peter Morales, to my good friend Susan Leslie, to Helena, and to the great people at um, Beacon Press, thank you so much for welcoming a little country boy to this gathering, this, this national, international gathering. I want this morning to talk about hate, discrimination, and violence cannot have the first, the last, or the loudest word. It seems as though hurt is all around us. June 12, Saturday, was the 52nd anniversary of the killing of Mega Evers right in front of his family when he was shot the day after John Kennedy declared that civil rights protections were not a, a democratic issue or a Republican issue, but a moral issue. And on that same day, 52 years later, the Orlando massacre occurred. A complicated, crazed man began firing, and when he finished, 49 were dead, and he took his own life, or he was killed, excuse me, mostly LGBTQ and four out of five Latinos, and many others were wounded, and the heart of the nation was shaken. Six days ago, June 17th, was the one-year anniversary when a race-crazed young man came in and shot nine souls at Mother Emanuel in Charleston and fled to Shelby, North Carolina, the original home of the writer of Birth of a Nation, where hate militia groups are still known to reside. Hurt is all around us. And so much of this hurt is driven by hate, racial hate, homophobic hate, religious hate, and the truth be told, it has a long history of causing hurt. And right now, hate desires that we react with hate. And truth be told, when you are hurting, there is the possibility of succumbing to revenge for hate. But I believe today that tears are the order of the day, prophetic mourning, the loss of life, we grieve the destruction and the hurt and the pain of so many in Orlando, but also across the nation. Many of our slaughtered and maimed brothers and sisters, yes, they were members of the LGBT community, members of the Latino community, but in the largest sense, we must say from our heart, they were our community. And despite what those who promulgate hate will try to say to us, 
they remain members of our human family of love and in death as they were in life. They are children of God made in the image of God and we must weep as one family. But while we cry, while we cry, we must also gain our composure and not allow hate or cynicism to have the first, the loudest, or the last word. In the book I read of faith, 1 John says, those who give in to hate are blinded and do not know what they are doing. We cannot use hate, America, as the path through our pain into our tomorrow because hate fuels hate racial hate, homophobic hate, religious hate, class hate, and the rhetoric of hate that drives the terrorists and the mob and the racists and the homophobe. We cannot give in to the culture of hate. That is why I'm so concerned right now in this nation about the rhetoric of hate because reading history, I can remember when George Wallace began the rhetoric of hate in February and he mainstreamed certain kinds of language that had often been kept in the back room, not that it was right in the back room, but, but he brought it into the mainstream. And by the end of 63, Mega Evers was dead, four little girls in a Birmingham church were dead, and the president was dead. Hateful rhetoric that co creates the, act the culture of hate has always been the prerequisite to violence. And so we must stand in protest to to hate, discrimination, and violence. We need a revival, a moral revolution of values in this nation. Especially because there are those who have tried to, as they have in the past, they're doing it in the present, hijack religion and use it in the service of hate and violence, and we cannot stand for it. That is why Dr. James Forbes and Sister Simone with nuns on the bus and Tracy Blackman and I have joined in a 22-city tour. We've been supported by Auburn University and Union University and the Cairo Center and our good friend, Reformed Jews, Jewish friends and Quakers and so many others. And why do I talk about hate, discrimination, and violence in this kind of trinity? Well, we must remember the wisdom of Coretta Scott King when after her husband was murdered by hate, she was asked what did she think about violence? And she said, yes, I know violence, the violence of murder, but that's not the only kind of violence. She said poverty can produce a most deadly kind of violence. She said, I remind you that starving a child is violence. Suppressing a culture is violence. Neglecting school children is violence. Discrimination against working people and not paying them a living wage is violence. Ghetto housing is violence. Ignoring medical needs is violence. Uh, hurting and undermining the dreams and the destiny of children, whether they be Israeli or Palestinian, whether they be Native or American-born, whether they be Hindu or Muslim, whether they be Asian or black or white or brown or inner city or gay or straight, anytime we undermine their dreams and their destiny, that is a form of violence. <laughs> Institutional and systemic racism, ignoring the poor, is a form of violence. And then she said, and I, pro I paraphrase, even a lack of willpower to help humanity is a sick and sinister form of violence. And so today, today we must mourn those killed in Orlando, and we must remember those from Charleston a year ago. But we must mourn and protest violence, discrimination, and hate in all of its forms. We must, we must protest in a country where too much of our public life is being driven by market values rather than the moral values of our Dietrich's religious faith. We must mourn and protest the continued systemic racism, not somebody simply calling you the N-word, but sometime when they never use the N-word, but they pass policies that create a disparate impact on black, brown people. 
Uh, we must mourn and protest being in a country where we have seen some of the worst bills passed against the LGBT community. And when we sing, uh, God bless America and shed his grace on, on America, but then we refuse grace to the LGBTQ community. We must mourn and protest the violence against working poor people in a country where 400 families make $97,000 an hour and we are arresting people who want to simply fight for 15. We must mourn and protest violence. We must mourn and protest violence where we have a country where states are still passing some of the worst anti-immigration bills in, this, in the world where children are literally being snatched from their schools, where politicians are, are pr pr promoting anti-immigration bills and they themselves come from immigrants and their own family could not have come here if their rules that they want now had been in place. We must, we must protest violence where we have a country where there are states that are continuing to make it easier to get a gun than it is to vote. Where we must protest the violence in a country now where we have less voting rights protection today than we had August 7, 1965, just a few minutes after the blood of James Reed was used to sign the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It is something wrong in our country when we are marching backwards across the Edmunds Pettus Bridge. We must. We must, the sound man, just turn this mic up just a little bit for me so I can hear myself. We must protest, we must protest the lock that the NRA has on too many of our politicians. That's violence. And we must protest and we must mourn those who will abuse the Second Amendment to guarantee guns, but then they want to undermine the 14th Amendment that guarantees equal protection under the law. And we must protest the violence of warmongering where we continue to have leaders that want to send boys and girls to fight the wars of rich people over, over oil and not protect the lives of the poor and have a real war on poverty right here in America. And we must mourn and protest Whatever it is, whatever hate and discrimination it is that allows a country to see a candidate endorsed for president whose party leadership calls him a racist and they say he's a racist but I'll still support him. Like, like Coretta Scott King taught us, we must speak out against all hate all discrimination and all violence because hate grows hate, discrimination grows discrimination, and violence grows violence. That's why I was glad to see John Lewis and others decide to sit in, decide to sit in and sit down because they are saying enough is enough. And so, right now, there's a call upon us to be visible signs of love, justice, equality, and nonviolence so that hate, discrimination, and violence cannot have the first, the last, or the loudest word. And right in, remember, right in the middle of some of the most violent days, Jim, of South Africa, Bishop Tutu remind, reminded the people, not after the violence was over, but in the middle of it, he said, victory is ours, goodness is stronger than evil, love is stronger than hate, light is stronger than darkness, and life is stronger than death. And as we do this, we can do it with hope. In love and nonviolence wins. 
No matter how bad it is right now, we're hurting. We have to, like the Sankofo bird, look backwards in order to go forward. We don't have to use hate to get through this moment. Let's remember what others have done before us. During the two and a half centuries of slavery, when the oppressor would kill white and black people out of hate whenever they heard the call of freedom, for the most part, the slaves and the abolitionists did not return hate for hate. They kept on pressing for justice, declaring up above my head, I hear music in the air, there must be a God somewhere. In the 1800s, when riots began in places like Wilmington and Gatling guns were brought in the city of Wilmington, North Carolina, and three to four percent of the people were killed, black and, and, and progressive whites, more people killed per capita than were killed on September the 11th, they didn't respond with hate versus hate. They kept on focusing on love and justice and mercy, and they won today. The hate spread in mob violence in the 1900s from New York to Springfield to St. Louis to Charleston, to Washington, D.C. In 1921, in Tulsa, some say over 300 black people were killed, burned 191 black businesses, 1,200 black homes, 10,000 African Americans were left homeless. But they didn't call for the hate and the destruction of all white people. They found a way to get together with whites and blacks, and they kept working for justice and freedom. There is a way forward. In 1943, right after the war, 242 cities had racial classes. We had 242 racial classes, 47 cities. But for the most part, we didn't give up on the possibility of democracy. We didn't give up and give it to hate. And on Christmas night, 1954, 51, Harriet Moore and his wife were blown up on Christmas Day, their anniversary. But the people that were left after them didn't give in to hate. They didn't put bombs under other people's How did they? they didn't say, give everybody a bomb. They didn't say, loosen the bomb laws. Instead, they said, freedom never dies. Freedom never dies. No bomb can destroy our dream. Freedom never dies. When Mamie Till lost her son, she didn't call for the killing of all white men. She didn't call for the banning of all white men. She opened the casket, let the world see what racism would do. She showed the world her tears, and, and Rosa Parks saw those tears. And Rosa Parks didn't get a gun. She didn't get a Molotov cocktail. She sat down on the bus so the Civil Rights Movement could stand up. There is a way forward. When those four little girls were killed 17 days after the march on Washington, their parents didn't call for the destruction of everybody who happened to be white. Instead, what they did was they cried and they prayed, and students said, if you kill those four, but hundreds of us are now coming. And they went to the South. They killed Swana, Cheney, and Goodman, said, maybe if we kill a Jew, if we kill an African American, if we kill somebody who's white, then the rest of the students will not come. But it was in their deaths that more more people came. They refused to stay away. They never gave in to hate. 21 years ago, when a hate craze anti-government militia member detonated a bomb and killed 168 people, including children and infants in Oklahoma City, hate went into a rage. But those parents didn't call for us to go find every militia member and kill them because they knew that hate only leads to more hate. Hate wants us to react in this moment. Hate wants us to be cynical in this moment. But we must remember that down through the years, and I question sometimes the media that says this is the worst. Well, we got to be careful about this. It's bad. My God, it's bad. But we need to understand that in our past, people have faced worse, and they still did not give in to the evil side of humanity. They suffered, but they refused to respond to hate with hate, and they believed that faith and love and nonviolence was still greater than hate. And so, as I conclude, we cannot in this moment, my Unitarian friends, fall into hate's trap. We cannot become cynical. We cannot go hide behind our walls of quarantine. No, no. 
we cannot lose our faith in faith and hope and love and justice. We cannot give into the politics of hate. And we surely cannot do this. We cannot allow those who have stirred hate. Uh, let me just say this quietly. Y'all didn't hear it, Mr. Trump. We didn't, we cannot allow those who have stirred up hate to now offer themselves to be the savior from hate. Instead, instead, those of us who have in our history the commonality of suffering from hate, but we also know from history that ultimately those who have won the day are those who chose love in the midst of hate those who chose not to let hate define their lives, those who rose from the crucifixion of hate to the resurrection of love, truth, and justice. My brothers and sisters, this is the time that we must choose whether we will lash out with fear and division and petulance and hate or whether we will embrace love more boldly and walk in truth and justice. I declare to you today the time is now for us to join those who lived before us, who in the face of hate chose community, chose love, chose nonviolence, chose the way of justice. Let us say on our watch, we will speak up, we will stand up, we will come together, and we will, be, we will make sure that love justice and equality and nonviolence has the first, the last, and the loudest word. We will do it, and together, 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 we shall overcome. Are you ready to answer that call? Yeah. Let the congregation say amen and amen. amen. What to say? Thank you, Reverend Barber. And a reminder to all that uh, Reverend Barber will be keynoting the racial justice track beginning in Union Station Ballroom B at 1045 this morning. Wow. Now is the time to call on the secretary of our association, Rob Eller Isaacs, for any announcements. I know that's anticlimactic, but <laughs> this is how we do democracy. After enlightenment, chopping wood, carrying water, Gender-neutral restrooms are located throughout our facilities, and they are marked and unlocked. Please, friends, allow those riding scooters and those with other mobility devices to leave the hall first, wait a few moments to depart, and remember the admonitions that were offered earlier about making space for everyone here. Please make sure that you've collected your personal items because items may shift during flight <laughs> and that you clean up after yourselves. We're moving the public witness state of emergence inside because of rain and thunderstorms predicted for this afternoon. It will be held inside the Patel Room at the Convention Center here on the third floor at 5 p.m. 
Please join us in your standing on the side of love shirt for a beautiful afternoon of music, action, and witness. This Saturday at 1.15 in the Plenary Hall, we'll be having our first General Assembly UUA Presidential Candidates Forum, featuring the Reverends Allison Miller, Susan Frederick Gray, and Jean Putke. GA participants are invited to submit questions in advance of this forum. The submitted questions will be reviewed by the election practices the Election Campaign Practices Committee, which the candidates have determined which will excuse me, which the candidates have determined will select the questions for Saturday's forum. Questions should be addressed to all three presidential candidates and can be submitted electronically at elections at UUA.org or by filling out a paper form that is available at the General Assembly office. Convention Center Room 111. Prior to 5 p.m. on Friday, we encourage and welcome your participation in shaping the future of our religious movement. Thank you. And one last reminder um, or notice the um, Business resolution on uh, dissolution has been perfected in conjunction with uh, council and others. And it, look for that handout tomorrow morning. It, uh, you should get a, a, a printout of that or paper on that so that before you get to the mini assembly, you'll be able to discern what, uh, what amendments you might want to offer in the mini assembly. There being no further business to come before us in accordance with the schedule set forth in your program book, I declare that this general session of the General Assembly shall stand in recess until 8.30 on Friday morning, June 24th. See you there.